but whoever loses their life for me will find it. 21st century, yeah, we get it. We know exactly what he means. First century, not so much. Oh, okay, what does that mean? <laughs> well, this one. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Hands up who likes persecution. <laughs> Blessed? Really? Blessed are you. <laughs> Here's another. So the last shall be first and the first shall be last, for many are called but few are chosen. I'd feel like a dumb kid if I was sitting at the feet of Jesus at this stage. I'd be putting up my hand at the back going, can you say that again? The first shall be last, the last shall be first. Few are chosen. I don't understand. <laughs> but today I want to focus on one of what I feel must have been the strangest things that Jesus ever taught. It's found in the Gospel of Matthew, and it's this one. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great amongst you must be your servant. And whoever wants you to be, who wants to be first must be your slave. Wow. Whether we live in the first century or the 21st century, <laughs> I believe human nature hasn't changed that much. You see, I believe that we prefer to be served than to serve. I think it's part of our humanity. We'd rather be served than to serve. How many of us would be thrilled, I wonder, if our children or grandchildren came back from a uh, careers evening, all excited, and said, oh, I found the perfect career for me. You yeah, beauty, what? Oh, I've never been so excited. What is it? Are you going to be a doctor or a lawyer? No, no, I'm going to be a servant. And if I'm really good, I can be a slave. <laughs> yeah, come on. Really? You see, that's the difference <laughs> between Jesus' teaching and what the world teaches us. We seek we just don't like to be thought of as servants. What's well, one of the best examples of that is in Australia today. We look no further to how we treat, what status we give, and how much we pay those who serve others. Who do you think is amongst the lowest paid in our country today? Would you believe it's aged care workers? People who look after our old people. <laughs> and child care workers. People who look after our children. These people <laughs> are people people. They look after our old and our young. And yet, we don't really value them. My daughter is the director of one of the um, child care centres. And for years, they told her, they said, she's just a glorified babysitter. And yet she had to get diplomas to get there. They didn't see that. Looking after kids, pff, anybody can do that. We don't value people who look after people. I wonder how you feel when you contrast that with the status and the payment we give to people who look after our money. <laughs> That's different, isn't it? An accountant? Financial advisor? It says a lot about, I have to be, this text. The truth is, our society preaches an ideology that simply says, he who dies with the highest status and the most toys wins. That's basically the world's teaching, I believe. So we see Jesus' teaching on servanthood is as strange to the people as today as it was on that sunny hillside when he first said it. People today find it absurd to think 
that you would want to be someone else's servant or someone else's slave. Unfortunately, we live in a time when it's all about me. We live in a society that's more about I than others. I know that, Christ I know that Christian parents have a hard time today. They have a hard time teaching their children to put others before themselves. It's a hard task to actually teach your children that there's someone more important than themselves. And as I was writing this, I remembered that old joke. I'm sure you remember it. It was the mum preparing pancakes for her two sons. Kevin is five and Ryan is three. The boys began to argue over who would get the first pancake. Their mother saw an opportunity for the moral lesson. If Jesus was sitting here, she said, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake, I can wait. <laughs> Hearing this, Kevin immediately turned to his younger brother and said, okay, Ryan, you be Jesus. <laughs> yeah, the truth, sad truth, is it's uh, hard for Christians to counter the world's teaching. And the reason is simple. We're comparing apples with oranges, I believe. The world is talking about physical gain, while Christians talk about spiritual gain. But to achieve that gain, we must develop a servant mentality and realise that as Christians, we're actually saved to serve. But aren't we saved by grace and not works, you ask? <laughs> That's true. But none of us, through good works, can earn our way to heaven. But then James reminds us of this. When he says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. I don't mind James. He's sort of fairly, I reckon James is a fairly shaped straight shooter. You know, he sort of, uh, he talks about uh, how we should uh, watch our mouth. And uh, he doesn't tend to mince his words. But it's true. We are saved to serve. So to gain spiritual maturity, you must resist the teaching of the world and develop a servant heart. But as we know, there are many hindrances to developing a servant mentality. The first and foremost, of course, is our own ego. Who's got an ego? Come on, put your hands up, we've all got one. <laughs> to exist, we all have to have self-belief. We have to know who we are. <laughs> I believe this is quite normal for human beings. But can you think of a time when you may have been asked to do a particularly dirty job and thought, I'm not doing that? <laughs> or have you ever dodged that job that you didn't want to do, but quite happy to put forward someone else's name you thought would do it? Oh, no, I'm not doing that. But hang on, well, John might. You'd have a go, I reckon. <laughs> Sadly, these, I believe, are also human traits. You see, it's hard to see develop a servant heart when our egos get in the way. When I think of my own life experience, I remember a time when I struggled with my ego. I was 15 years old, full of self-importance. I was bulletproof. I'd just begun my first job as an apprentice lineman in the New Zealand Post Office. And for those who have ever served as an apprentice or a junior knows it's your job to do everything that others don't want to do. <laughs> I had my share of embarrassment when asking a storeman for a left-handed screwdriver. Or going to a guy, the foreman, and asking for a long wait, which I was assured was actually to hold the lines down while I put tension on the lines, in which my foreman just shook his head and thought, you idiot. But it's easy to serve when you're an apprentice. You're expected to know nothing and do everything. <laughs> but I wonder how many of my foremen at the time would have been happy for going for lunches or making the tea. I think their egos might have gotten in the way, you see. They were above all that now. So how can we count, counteract our egos? Here's what I believe we can learn from the example of our master. Remember the account of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples? As we know, in Jesus' times, the streets were dusty. They were filled with animal dung. The temperatures were hot. Put them all together and you get hot, smelly feet. Not a wonderful thing to think of in church, is it? But that's the reality of it. That's what you had found in Jesus' time. It was an accepted practice that the lowest servant in the household, when people came in from those dirty streets, was to wash their feet. 
especially when you think in, in those times when, we, when people ate, they reclined. They didn't sit at the table, they actually lay down on the table. And so it would be really nice if you were sitting next to your, your brother who was lying that way and your head was by his feet and you were starting to eat. You get the picture? Yeah. So they washed their feet before they came in. But that was, the, that was it. It was the lowest servant's job to do that. Yet scriptures reveal to us that this was a task that Jesus took on himself. <laughs> the master himself. He knew exactly who he was. And that's what I love about Jesus. He knew exactly who he was. He had no need to, to demonstrate his importance or his status. In fact, he did the very opposite in doing so. By washing the feet, he demonstrated that he was willing to die to his own ego. And I think he teaches us a wonderful thing just in that scripture. There's a freedom in not having to always defend your own status or self-importance. <laughs> Isn't it nice to know God says, I will, if you humble yourself, I will raise you up. I've got to tell you, I can't see myself raising myself up more than my God can. So for me, it's a good deal. So here we have Jesus teaching us that it doesn't matter about what you think your, your status is. If you humble, you humble yourself, your God will lift you up. So when you look out in our world today, unfortunately you see people who seek their self-worth from people of other opinions of other people. They place their value in what other people think of them. And that's really, really hard. It's really hard because, as we know, sadly, if things go wrong, it can really take a toll on people's lives. I wonder how many young people we've lost in our country today through social media. With kids getting on social media and attacking each other, calling each other horrible names and putting it out there. Sadly, some of this behaviour has caused children to, to actually suicide. And that's just so sad because they put all their thoughts about their worth, their ego, into what other people thought of them. What Jesus taught us it's not about what other people think of you. It's about what God thinks of you. And when you do that, suddenly all the world can throw all those fiery darts and it doesn't really mean that much. The servant heart is motivated by love to serve others. Jesus' love was undeserved, unending, unconditional and unselfish. It was not the worthiness or the merits of the disciples that drove Jesus to serve his disciples by washing their feet. They didn't warrant it. <laughs> they weren't above his status. He wasn't the lowest amongst them. But he was choosing to show the servant heart, the true servant heart. Think about it. Jesus even washed the feet of Judas Iscariot that night. The man who would betray him and have him killed in the very next day. True servants possess the security and who they are, and this allows them to serve others. Jesus knew who he was. He was secure enough to get down to the floor and wash his disciples' feet. He didn't have to prove anything. He didn't have to try and prove or show his own importance or status. In fact, he had nothing to prove, nothing to lose, and nothing to hide. As a wise man once said regarding Jesus washing the feet of the disciples, he said, the insecure are into titles. <laughs> the secure are into towels. Because as you remember, Jesus put a towel around his waist and bowed down to wash the feet of his, his disciples. A servant heart doesn't wait, it acts. Jesus didn't wait for someone to clarify the protocol. He didn't wait for someone else to do it. He saw a need and he acted. No one else volunteered for the foot washing job that night. So Jesus made an object, object lesson of it. He started something that he hoped would be passed down from those 12 disciples to others. We know that washing dirty, smelly feet will never be in vogue. 
Yet it will be done by servants who are willing to put their egos aside and act in humility and sacrifice for others. But have you ever noticed how a servant heart exposes the pride in others? You see, Peter had a hard time letting Jesus serve him. He still possessed a worldly mindset and assumed that someone of Jesus' status should never stoop to wash dirty, dirty feet. Here Jesus was leading by example, demonstrating status as no place in Christian leadership. And alternatively, Christian leaders must learn to let others serve them. The truth is, some Christian leaders become so used to serving others, it's difficult for them to relax and receive. But here, Jesus was teaching his disciples not only to serve, but to be served. After Jesus washed his disciples' feet, he discussed the meaning of his foot washing. He reminded them that the Master and Lord had just washed their feet. So no perceived position or status should prevent them from doing the same to someone else. Jesus let them know that if the Master had washed their feet, there was no excuse for them not washing the feet of others. In fact, his example was much more powerful than his lecture about the principles of service. As always with Jesus, his actions always speak louder than his words. <laughs> I believe the greatest blessing follows those who step out by faith and do the opposite of what the world is doing. God blesses those who go countercultural and serve people with no thought of getting something in return for themselves. When we look at today's world, we see a world that does not think highly of servants. To be a servant is to be the, one of the lowest positions in our society. You won't hear anyone boast that their job is a servant. In fact, most people will be ashamed to call themselves a servant. Yet we know we still call people servants. If you work for the government, you're called a public servant. If you're the prime minister, you're supposedly be a servant of the people because our government is actually governed by the people. But society's turned all that in its head. And now we see that servant, what we know by me, my servant, and what others know by servant, is something completely different. However, as we know, Christians do not live for the opinions or applause of man, but only for applause for our God. And I believe it's one of the greatest challenges of Christians today is to reject the self teaching of our modern society and develop a servant heart. And we know that from Scripture that when we embrace true servanthood, Jesus himself makes us a promise. And he says this, Verily, truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is the messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you forget them. No, if you do them. And that's the thing. It's not easy to be a servant. It's probably one of the hardest things a human being can do. It means dying to yourself in a lot of times. It means not seeing yourself as important as others. But I think there's a great freedom in being a servant too. There's that great freedom of not being able to, not having to always push your own barrow and tell everybody else how good you are. There's a great freedom in saying, I'm happy to serve other people. There's a lovely lady that I met in my life, it was Linda's grandmother. She was from Ireland and she came out as, and her um, immigration to New Zealand was as a domestic servant. And I remember reading that and thinking even then, that was in the, the, the mid 70s, thinking, I wonder how many people now would allow you to put that on their immigration papers. We would have a nice word for it now. We certainly wouldn't call it a domestic servant. But that was Granny Turks. That's what she came in as from Ireland, as a domestic servant. And she was <laughs> one of those beautiful ladies that, you know, you, had, you went to her house, you had to sit down, she would serve the tea. You could see that she was a perfect you know, little servant. That's who, that's who she was. She loved to serve others. But that's not true, sadly, for today. We don't 
like the word servant. We don't like the word serve. We don't like the words to think that you know we are, our importance or other people are more important than we are. But I beg to differ, and I think Jesus begs to differ as well. He wants a church full of servants. He wants his people to be servants. And if they're really good servants, they may even become slaves. And as strange as that may seem, I think when we see that we serve others selflessly, then that's the major difference we can actually put between a Christian lifestyle and a worldly lifestyle. And when that's seen, people do take notice. I remember reading a book about a little teacher in a finishing school, Catholic finishing school in Switzerland, who left that profession and followed what she thought God was calling her to do. He took her from that exclusive school into the dirty streets of Calcutta. <laughs> Where God had told her to go and minister to and care for and love the untouchables and the poorest people of that city who were literally dying in the streets and being collected like rubbish in the morning. That lady followed that order from God and she became first Sister Teresa and then Mother Teresa of Calcutta. When Sister Re Teresa died, the whole of India and probably the whole of the world stopped to take note. She was small in stature. You know, she'd be nearly five foot tall. Tiny little skinny lady. But what a powerhouse for God. And why? Because she had the true servant heart. On the day that uh, she, uh, on a, the funeral, when they took her through the streets of Calcutta, it didn't matter to those people whether they were Hindu whether they were Muslim, whatever their religion was, they stopped and paid homage to the little lady that had served them so well. That to me is the power of servanthood. That's the power that I think that Jesus wants us to tap into. An amazing power that the church embraced. Whew, pretty powerful stuff. But Maybe the last word should be left today to one of the greatest evangelists that Christianity has ever known, a guy called D.L. Moody. And he once said this, The measure of man is not how many servants he has, but how many men he serves. He got it, the act of servanthood. And so we see the beautiful thing about uh, Moody was he actually understood what servant, true servanthood was. But there was another servant. The most amazing servant I think has ever been. And there's our Lord Jesus Christ. He came into this world and said, I don't come to be served, but to serve. He came in as a servant. But I know the next time he comes, he won't come as a servant. You come riding on a cloud and the whole world will know that he is Lord the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings and so you ask the music team to come back could we um, sing of that time let's sing one last song today simply called These Other Days of Elijah <laughs>